This episode is brought to you by Twizzlers. Long day, late night, feeling a little bored. Twizzlers is the ultimate sidekick for any moment of the day, no matter what kind of day you're having. The perfect level of sweet and a fun excuse to sit back and relax. Unwind with Twizzlers. To buy now, visit Hersheyland.com slash Twizzlers. The family that vacations together stays together. At least that was the plan. Except now the dastardly desk clerk is saying he can't confirm your connecting rooms. Uh, wait, what? That's right, ma'am. You have rooms 201 and 709. No, we cannot be five floors away from our kids. Eh, the doors have double locks. They'll be fine. When you want your connecting rooms confirmed before you arrive, it matters where you stay. Welcome to Hilton. I see your connecting rooms are already confirmed. Hilton, for the stay. This episode is brought to you by Indeed. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash MBO. Terms and conditions apply. Age of Radio. Coming up, no longer protected by his exemption, Kaji is conscripted into the army. His humanism survived its failure in the labor camp, but can it survive the horrors and humiliations of life in the Imperial Japanese Army? All this and a round of rice balls for all this week on For Screen and Country. よと Now the English language version for our listeners, Jason and Brendan are doing a podcast, Human Condition 2. Podcast. Hello to all of our friends out there, our listeners, our supporters, and all the ships at sea. Welcome. My name is Jason. That over there is Brendan. I'm pointing at him. You know me, that D-O-double-G. That's right. Riding once again with that B-A-double-D-A double crooked letter, B-I-double-L-Y-G-U-double-N. Yes. That is that is his name, and do not forget it. Oh, you didn't know? I, no, I know. Your ass better call somebody. Uh, My, my ass should call somebody? <laughs> And this is a podcast called For Screen and Country. That's right. That's right. And this is a podcast where we just kick back and chill, mm-hmm. and talk about, you know, some some real bogus stuff. The weather. Yeah. The news. But also, man's inhumanity to man, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. War! What is it good for? In this case... Podcasting content. Oh, okay. War, huh? Good God, y'all. What is it good for? Podcasting content. That's right. Yeah. And I, I don't mean in the direct historical sense. You can talk to your Dan Carlins. You can talk to your uh, 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 guy that does the rev- Mike, 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 Mike Duncan's revolutions. You can talk to Mike Duncan. I thought you were uh, going to say you could talk to your damn Carlins. Like you were saying, like, you're George Carlins, but you were angry about it. Like, you your talk damn Carlins. To your well, damn, no, I mean, talk to your damn, damn Carlins. Carlins. Uh, d- 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 that includes George and Dan. Okay. 
They're not related, but what they're about both Jeff, named Carlin. What about Jeff Garland? Uh, funny guy. Uh, maybe don't get too close to him. What about Carlos Santana? A uh, fine guitar player with bad opinions. Wait, wait, Jeff Garland, don't get so close to him. Did he do a bad thing? He's a bit of a he's a bit of a fondler, I think. I think he gets oh. a little too close to people. He maybe he's maybe he's one of these over actor guys that maybe touches people too much. I know he made a lot of people uncomfortable, and that's why he was not allowed to finish out the last season of the Goldbergs. Oh, that okay, that makes sense. That, and that's, that's a shame because uh, a shame for those people and a shame for me because I really like Jeff Garland. He's really funny. <laughs> well, I guess he can just go out, go and hang out with Horatio Sands in that. Yeah, regard. yeah, a couple of fat creeps hanging out together. <laughs> <laughs> But but two of the funniest fat creeps you'll ever meet. A couple of fat creeps. <laughs> Look, oh. I, as a fat creep, I can say that. Jason, you're not a creep. Am I? <laughs> you get That's it? That's right. I don't. I don't. Oh, okay. So, podcast. But- Look, this is enough fucking around. We got to get down to business. And the business that we have on this podcast, Brendan, is the business of war movies. And the business of which of those war movies is great, as ordained by Paste Magazine. And we confirm that fact or not Mm -hmm. in podcast form. You know, never have I ever heard a more um, convoluted, more detailed, but yet confusing breakdown of a podcast uh, premise than ours every single week. Look, if, if everybody knew exactly what it was right out of the gate, would it be that fun? I don't know. I'm I biased. Mean, I, I, think, I think people can pretty much figure it out. They, they, they're, they're, they're dummies and they watch movies and they talk about it. And then you get a, you get a free download and we brighten your day because we're good people. We're good people. We're you know, Jason likes to say this is how Jason likes to say, it, and I don't personally agree. But he always likes to refer to us as a couple of nice guys. That's what he says. He was like, he said, you know, we're we're just a couple of nice guys, really nice guys who deserve nice ladies. I usually like to sing it. We're some nice guys. Look at our hats. We're some nice guys. My lady is allowed to relax. I'm like uh, I'm I'm like uh, that guy and uh, I'm like Riverdance in his movie where he had to like trade his hat off with a woman who gave him a, another hat for no reason in the middle of the scene. If if you wore one of the hats that he wore, Brennan, I think you would look as foreign to hat wearing as he did. <laughs> I'm already foreign to hat wearing. That's what I'm saying. He clearly is. He, he I mean that's the thing. You put Michael Flatley in a headband, perfect. Looks natural because he wore it all the time, but not a hat. You know, most people, and when I say most people, I mean every person that's listening right now is like Michael Flatley in a movie. What are you, what are you dummies talking about? Just talk about this movie. Yeah, you're right. You're right. If you want to hear us talk about Blackbird, go check out What Were They Thinking? Uh, It's a whole different podcast. But we are going to talk about a movie this week. Brendan, we are continuing on the human condition triptych. We are, we are now two films into this three film trilogy. The story of our friend Kaji. Mm-hmm. And this is the dark middle chapter. Uh, this is in the Empire what Strikes I, Back. Yeah, this is the Empire Strikes Back. This is Kaji being drafted into the military because, as you'll remember, at the end of the last film, he lost his exemption when he got fired from the forced labor camp. Mm-hmm. This this one also has the subtitle because uh, you said the first one, "No Greater Love." Uh, this one, "The Human Condition uh, Two, Part Two, whatever you want to say it, uh, Road to Eternity." Hmm. Hmm. Sounds oh. sounds daunting and sounds like it's not going to be a uh, pleasant experience for old Kaji. Well, I mean, it, it, what, I mean, yeah, because one way to interpret Road to Eternity is just straight up dying. Wow. Okay. Or going to die. We don't know. Spoiler alert. We don't know. Maybe maybe he finds the road to, and there's like a, 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 a northern Manchurian village called Eternity. Maybe he finds a magical talisman that gives him three wishes, and he wishes World War II away. Can you imagine, Jason, if we watch this hyper-realistic, like, uh, hailed as a masterpiece, war anti-war triptych, and it mm. ends with Kaji finding a magical genie, as a magical genie as opposed to a regular genie that grants wishes, yeah. and he just reverses <laughs> World War II, and everyone's happy at the end. What, like, do you think this would have the reputation <laughs> 
Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. I think it uh, it would uh, perhaps have gotten a, a recut at some point. But you know what? I'd, I'd love the idea of a movie doing that, of being so out there at the yes. end to just completely just <laughs> just punch the effort. audience in the balls. Well, I mean, it's not I guess it's kind of it's kind of what AI artificial intelligence did. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, that's that's a different movie for a different time. But a human different condition list. to Road to Eternity, like you said, Jason, this carries on carries over from the last one in that now he uh because of his uh, uh actions in the first movie you know trying to do good things mm. he is uh, now in basic training um with the japanese imperial army not a uh fun place to be in world war no. II. no no i mean no no army is a picnic uh, uh for anyone but the japanese army was particularly extra as the kids say I mean, they were on the side of the of fascism. I mean, they can't be that. It can't be that great of an experience, right? Well, it was e- even beyond just fascism. It was that combined with traditional Japanese culture toward mil- military, which had been, you know, something that was rather harsh back in the samurai days. And when the Meiji Restoration happened, and um, the Japan started westernizing their military. A lot of those attitudes remained, and you had that. And in fact, where where some attitudes had fallen out of favor, as I understand, stuff like the Bushido Code, which was something that was kind of uh, prevalent during some part of the samurai era, but it had fallen out of favor, and kind of along with the samurai had kind of gone the way of the dodo. But it was brought back by the by the new new imperial Japan as a way of you know encouraging their troops to fight to the end. You're gonna feel real stupid when the dodo comes back. I am. I am. I really want to try one. Apparently, they're delicious. That's uh. You're the reason things aren't. You're the reason we can't have nice things, Jason. Look, I just think that if we're gonna bring animals back from the dead, I think that's fair. We should eat uh, them. If we're gonna play God, we should at least eat them. Well, I'm at least glad that that's your that's your uh, 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 feelings on hunting as well. So I'll take it for yeah. what I I'll take what I can get. Absolutely. But here we are, Brendan. It's the human condition part two. Kaji's been drafted into the Imperial Japanese military, a famously brutal organization mm-hmm. uh, for training. Now, Kaji's a little older, I would say, than your average uh, uh, buck recruit. <laughs> so you're going to say than your average bear? <laughs> but uh, this is 1943, so they haven't totally gone through their reserve of, of available people yet. It, certainly in the, in the second half of this movie, we'll start seeing... Uh, older folks being drafted into the uh, army because it's 1945, but we're in 1943 at this point. Yeah. And yeah, Kaji, so... Kaji leaves one terrible existence for another, although he essentially now is the prisoner <laughs> in this experience. Well, that's the thing. Like, I mean, if you look at the first movie, he was kind of a prisoner in some ways in that he really was pretty helpless and he was under the control of a lot of different people, but he was a this... prisoner. He was a prisoner of his, of the system. Essentially. Yeah. Uh, he was restricted to what he could feasibly do. And when mm-hmm. he does the one thing that he can do, it results in him losing his position completely. Right. And this time, like almost legitimately, he is a prisoner, but because not only is he in the army, Jason, which is a tough thing in itself, He's also still under suspicion. Yeah. He's also still under the guise of, like, they could throw me in jail at any time, and, and, and I wouldn't even know it. I mean, they're calling him, left and right, they're calling him a, a, a red, a communist. They're referring to him as a, uh, a, a traitor, a deserter, yeah. all this mm. stuff. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Um, and it's so funny because, like, from our perspective, and this is the thing that I think in my mind... Because there was that moment in high school where I was reading about communism, and communism was something that I only knew of, you know, from a, a certain lens. And reading about communism being like, oh, so the kind of central thesis is that everybody shares with each other. Okay, and that's the thing that everybody's mad at. Like, I get, I get reasons to not like communism, but that's the reason everybody's mad that the society suggests they share. It's like it's it's kind of the same idea where it's like he just is a person that wants to treat people with basic respect, and that is seen as subversive to their system. In fact, there was a moment in the previous movie, I don't think we mentioned it, where uh, uh, the sergeant comes into his house when Michiko is there, and he starts looking at all his books on the wall, and he's like, oh, Western books, eh? I see I see somebody's been doing a little reading. And yeah, like a, 
that he's getting he's getting subversive ideas from outside his uh, cultural sphere of influence. Well, and, and it's that the is whole... seen as suspect. Well, because it's the whole idea that, like, I think they're aware that it's such a flimsy basis that if if they were to look outside of that for any considerable amount of time, they would see how this this the system that they're living under is maybe not so good. Yeah. Well, and and it's just that everybody's so and I think this is maybe a reflection on Japanese society as a whole, but everybody is so committed to the hierarchy like the hierarchy is everything like the the seniority of the older of the older recruits to the newer recruits is paramount and then when we get to the next section of the movie the the seniority of the veterans the guys that have already been in combat is 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 is, super, is you know is set in stone compared to the new recruits and they are allowed to basically treat the recruits any way they want similarly in this movie yeah or in this part, yeah, both parts. It's just, it's basically a lot of this movie, a good chunk of it is Kaji getting the shit beat out of him or him trying to stop somebody else from getting the shit beat out of them. Which really was a lot of the last movie too. There's a lot of slapping in this movie. Yes, a yes, a lot of slapping. I will say, um, I, I appreciate that in this movie, it does kind of, it does kind of the Empire Strikes Back sort of thing and that we don't start immediately from where we left off we kind of cut in the mid into the middle of the story and to, like a, like a little bit of time has passed he's not just yeah. going into uh he's not just going into basic training when we start he's been in basic training for a little bit yeah. as we're getting started um so it's interesting to to cut into kind of the middle with kaji already serving and we kind of establish um they establish nicely that you know like he's a you know he's a pretty good soldier he's a pretty good uh he's working pretty hard in in basic training as far as like um you know doing what he's being told to do in terms of just like the regular routine stuff he's doing pretty good like there's not a whole lot of complaining there it's just that of course you have as we said in the last movie the people in control that are maybe not so fair to <laughs> the people that are not in control um yeah. To the point where I think there's a there's a line early on I wrote down because I said, okay, this is going to apply to a lot of things, I feel. But someone says, logic won't get you anywhere in this army. And re if you yep. remember the last movie, a lot of his – well, he wrote a thesis that was very much like, logically, this is what we need to do to up the production is to treat people like people. And essentially, this is a shorthand way of saying your theory also won't work here. Like it's not gonna, it's yeah. not gonna get you anything. But it's also kind of, it's also kind of weighted uh, oddly too, because it's almost like they're telling him like, if you want to get anywhere in this army, like almost like if you want to be promoted, if you want to lead, you can't use your, uh, your, 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 your hard left uh, theories about treating human beings not like animals. No. But that's no, not even necessarily gonna, what he wants. You're gonna have to do what you have to do in so many armies, which is politic. He just wants to survive, though. He has no... I don't think yeah. he has any injury. At this point, I, th I would say in the first movie, he wanted to, you know, kind of make waves because he was trying to enact change. I think in this yeah. movie, he just wants to survive. Yeah, I think he learned his lesson and he wants to try to keep his head down. But his his sense of humanism prevents him from fully just assimilating into the background. He... Because um, we haven't mentioned... We got to mention uh, Obara. Yeah. Uh, the, the private pile of this movie. I was uh, just going to say, if we're going to mention Obaro, we got to mention this movie, at least up until the intermission, very similar in vibe and almost story to Full Metal Jacket in some ways. I would be very surprised if Kubrick hadn't seen this at some there's, point. And there's the no way to Full he Metal Jacket. <laughs> yeah, there's absolutely no way. Because they, like you said, Obara, I mean, obviously there's some differences. He doesn't yes. kill anyone else. But it's still very, it is very similar to Vincent D'Onofrio's uh, yeah. character in Full Metal Jacket. Yeah, so we've essentially got Obara. He's a small guy. He's got bad eyes. He can't shoot. You know, he's he's basically a weedy little nerd. And the rest of the unit will not let him forget it. And he's he's doing his best he can, but he's just, he's not a soldier. He's mm. his, his body is clearly not designed to be a soldier. He, uh, uh, and, and whereas... Kaji has the advantage of Kaji's got enough skill that he's able to because essentially Kaji has to kind of prove himself. So the fact that he could be a, a top notch soldier, like he's a good shot, he's 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 got stamina, like he is a good soldier. The fact that he is a good soldier and a good fighter can help cover his ass for his views. Obara doesn't have that. Now it's not that Obara has any particular views, but 
Well, he he writes honest letters home to his wife, I was which of course say, gets yeah. censored, and he gets shit for them. I was just gonna say, yeah, he do, he may not outright state them, but he certainly writes them. Yeah, um, and then he's forced to write a letter, essentially saying the the problem is that uh, you because his his whole thing is like his kind of at home story is that his wife and his mother are always at odds with each other. And he basically is forced to write a letter that says your uh, your bickering is causing hardships. Like it's got nothing to do. Everything is going great, but your bickering is distracting me from my training. Yeah. Um, Make him write a very formal sounding. the The role of a Japanese housewife is to maintain her husband's home, and if you don't feel you can do that, you uh, I expect you to leave the home or something like ridiculous. Yeah, bullshit. like some some sort ins- of thing that Obara would never write to his wife, and she fucking knows it. Yeah, some insanely misogynistic shit. Especially when we meet her later and you're like, mm. oh yeah, no, there's no way she bought any of this that he was saying. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, he is that. He is essentially that character. He is put upon over and over and over again. It is, it is, it is brutal. I mean, to the point where they make him, they make him kind of role play as a prostitute when he does it. What, yeah. what is he? Because he, he doesn't. They're all on a run, a march, yeah. and Forced he can't march. do it. He has to. He has the cart has to pick him up for the rest of the way because he's just destroyed. He's exhausted. And when he gets there, um, him and two other people were on the cart, and they specifically make him act out this like ridiculous. You know, you're a prostitute, and you have to you have to wave to one of us and get us to come see you in the window and all this shit. It is a hard scene to watch. It's brutal. Yeah. It is brutal. You see this man that's just, just just clearly mentally just falling apart at the seams. And this guy who's supposed to be his commander, like w- one of the guys that's supposed to be his commander. Um, I, I, I don't have his name now. Uh, he's uh, uh, Yoshida. He's supposed yeah. to be the guy that's senior private, I guess. But he's still yeah, supposed PFC. to be the guy that's like, you know, not doing this to people. And... It just, yeah, you could tell, like, he just, he just completely breaks down. Um, this, this scene, now, obviously, it wasn't the same, but, man, this triggered some memories in me of high school. Of, oh, okay. I was not, now, I got bullied a little bit in school, because I was a fat kid, right? But never to this level. But I did see uh, uh, a classmate of mine who was a small guy at the time, uh, very skinny, very nerdy. Didn't mean any harm in the world, but he was just such an easy target, and the bullies would just fuck with him. And there were too many times where I stood by and watched it happen. Occasionally, I I would jump to his defense, but never nearly as much as I should have. Um, the be- the best ending to that story though is that that guy I saw him recently, and he's like six foot six now, and he's huge. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. nobody will ever. And he's the same guy. It's weird. He's the same nerdy kid he always was. He's just fucking massive now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the other guy, but, yeah. and some of the other people that bothered him are probably in jail so there you go uh yeah i yeah yeah and if they're not they probably fucking deserve to be <laughs> except except one of the guys is still one of the guys that bullied him unfortunately also one of the nicest people i've ever met i don't know why he was so mean to this kid mm. and i know he feels bad about it because he, he would feel bad about it but uh, awful awful um yeah so obara is uh, is his story is obviously tragic um, because eventually Jason, he decides to take his own life and yeah. it's, it's also very similar to private pile in, in full metal jacket. Not, he doesn't shoot anyone else, but no, he goes into the bathroom though. <laughs> he does go into the bathroom again. Kubrick definitely watched this. He grabs his rifle except, he- okay, th- here's the main difference. I'm sorry, but here's the main difference is that for some reason, and I don't know if this was intentional, but poor Obara's death plays like a comedy beat. Oh, and I think it is. I think it's supposed to be, a, well, I think it's supposed to be very, obviously very dark as a yeah. comedy beat. But the, he, the, it's just, just of the, of the randomness of life sometimes. Yeah. No, well, and the, I think this, I think the darkness of it is this. He can't, he's, he's hitting the trigger. Like he's going to take his own life. He's got this thing tied up. So it'll pull the trigger with his foot and it won't work. And I'm Jason, I don't know about you, but I'm watching this like tensing up every single yeah. time he does it because I'm like waiting for something accidental to happen. Yeah. And then right at the last second he says, "Okay, this must be a sign. I'm meant to live." You're yeah, surely more people have gone through more than this. And as he stands up, he accidentally triggers it. 
and shoots he himself. He pulls the trigger a third time and it goes off and kills him. But I think Fuck. the saddest part about that is like, yeah, it's kind of done as a very dark comedy beat, but it's also like because he's committed suicide, that means his family doesn't get like a lot of like like money. I th- I think yeah. is what they say, or or at least they have to wait longer or something like that. Yeah, because in because you know what you could commit suicide in Japanese society to save your honor, but I think there was there was a process for that. You couldn't just do it. You had to like you had to like be witnessed or something and do it a specific way, whether that was the harikiri type situation or what. But yeah, yeah. so that's interesting. That so it's like it's like not only does he. And then, but and then you knowing the truth in that is that he in that moment was like, no, I want to live. I think that's the tr- the most tragic part of the whole thing is that he did decide at the last moment he's going to stand up, maybe not stand up for himself, but you know he's gonna he's gonna stick with it and and he, maybe maybe I mean, make an effort to to um to stand up for himself a little bit. I mean, I can imagine what he was because the fact that he tried twice, tw- yeah. two times, he was willing to end his own life, and he did it. For and someone then it, to try he, once is some is yeah. one thing, and it didn't work. And then yes, because I mean, yes, I don't know what what reasonable person wouldn't think. Maybe I sh- maybe I shouldn't die at this point. Maybe there's a good reason for me to live. Maybe I should take advantage of this, whether that's God or whatever. But yeah, ugh, man, poor Obara. Yeah, it's it's uh, he's definitely the um, uh, there's a sim- similarly uh, tragic character uh, to the first the first movie, of course. And by the way, his wife, she seems pretty awesome. Like, yeah. he was the kind of character that if this were a cartoon, he would have like an overbearing fucking like like rolling pin a rolling carrying pin, yeah. wife. Yeah. <laughs> With an apron. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then and then a crazy mother who just and they were always at each other's throats. But no, she was just she struck me as a bit of a stronger woman, maybe than Michiko. Like yeah. like a, a harder woman, like seasoned. a more peasant woman, seasoned woman. Well, because but... later on when she shows up and tough ob- as nails. Yeah. Obviously, they're not telling her the truth. They're not telling her anything. They're just saying, like, you know, oh, it's because, probably because of what you were doing. Your argument, arguing with his mother, it drove him to blah, blah, blah. That was probably part of it. And Kaji has to go along with this yeah. as well. Because he's if he stands there and starts talking about that, I mean, they're going to fucking put him in prison or whatever. But yeah. uh, and just, just for her to look at him in the eyes, too, and say, can you just tell me the truth? And he says, that's that, that's that's what it is. Like, it's it's a brutal scene. And that woman, um, for her brief time in this movie, has a great fucking performance. She does. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, Japanese army, you know, and along with all the beatings, when um, when Obara kills himself, the unit gets punished for that. And they 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 have to look at his body. I mean, covered, yeah. but like they still have to do all their like morning exercises or whatever with his body right there. Well, they're making them like do like a push up stance and hold it. Like they're basically torturing them at that point. Like, yeah, to t- toughen them up, you know, take them to the top of the mountain, as as the boys in the back might say. And they just keep saying, you know, this he was weak. He was weak. We have this is this is our job to weed out weak people like this. Mm. There's no sympathy yeah. whatsoever from a single person other than Kaji. I think they're fucking Spartans over here, babe. Yeah, and it's it's interesting just knowing like and seeing what happened in the first one because we do have a lot of scenes of Kaji trying to help this guy. I mean, when they're marching and he keeps falling, he's like he's helping him, and then eventually he's like he's he's kind of he slaps him not hard, but he slaps mm-hmm. him and says like, "Listen, you got to get up on your feet. Like the you will yeah. the beating you are gonna get will be unlike anything you've ever experienced if you don't get up." And he's like simply like, "I can't." And even later, Kaji says, you know, I should have just stopped with him. And then at least maybe I could have helped him because I would have went through the same thing. And we could have had a, you know, we could have helped each other. And but he says, but I didn't. And I I feel like these are adding up throughout this series. I feel like all these little moments that that Kaji realizes he made the wrong choice. It's the, gonna, the moments it's, where he has to sacrifice his humanism for pragmatism. Yeah, it's. I feel like all these moments are weighing on him. And I mean, I don't want to talk about the ending right now, but clearly we do get a bit of a breakdown there. But I think in the third one, I think it's really going to come crashing on him mm. at some point. It's got to. It I mean, to. it's, it it's psyche can only take so much. Yeah, he's he's going through a lot of trauma through the course of, of these uh, uh, two movies so far. Yeah. Um, also, uh, so we talk about 
um, Obara, I just want to mention to uh, Michiko is in this movie briefly. Mm. Uh, not a lot, but she does have, again, one of the more interesting parts of this movie because, and I wondered about this too. I said, there's no way this is like protocol because she goes to visit him and they allow it to happen. And yeah, they even I, give them the storeroom for the visit. And obviously I, implying that it's like a, a, a conjugal visit. I saw the lieutenant reading reading his letter and I was like, fuck, you don't write to your husband's unit commander. This guy's going to get so much shit. And then she shows up but and she I just was cringing the whole time thinking like, oh, they're going to, the poor Kaji, he's going to get beaten terribly. But they treat him very well. And I think, I don't know, I, I think it must be, it's like, well, he's married, right? So they feel like obliged to let him have a conjugal visit with his wife who's there. I think there's something more sinister to it, though. You think so? Well, first of all, I would I gotta say, like, I, I don't I don't think you can get too mad at the character for writing that letter. I mean, she doesn't know what's gonna happen. She doesn't know but... she she's not in the know. And as we saw in the first movie, he keeps her in the dark a lot. He keeps her like a mushroom most of the time. But um I don't know, because when she shows up and they have their, you know, essentially conjugal visit as if he's in a prison, I don't even I, I don't even know that they make love. But anyway, uh, th- the next day, he's obviously, you know, tired um, and they're and everyone else knows about it, too. And they're kind of resenting him for it. I feel like they did it because they knew he would be resented. And I feel like they did it to 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 make his life es- to make his life seemingly better with this visit, but but really worse. Sort of a sort of a private pile eating the donut, uh, yeah, uh, sort of thing. Yeah. While everyone else is marching around him, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> um, okay. because but, um, I just I, yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, you're probably right. It's probably a way just to fuck with Kaji because everybody just seems to want to fuck with Kaji because again, he wants to treat people. With kindness, and that is seen as a weakness what by a everybody. Fucking around. asshole! I know. Well, and it, I think this. I think this. The scene too, when he's with his, uh, with his wife. Well, I guess she's not technically his wife yet, is she? Michiko. Yeah, I, th- I think they got married before he, they went. Before he went to the labor camp. Okay. Well, when he's with Michiko, um, there's a scene that really kind of. It's a. It's a, it's a. It's an oof. It's a. It's a hard hitting one because. It see, I mean, it, 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 when you first hear it, you don't think it, but but she keeps saying like, you have to promise to come back alive. You have to promise to to not die out here. And he says, yes, I'll come back alive. Of course, I'm gonna come back to you. But then he says, can you remove all your clothes? I want to etch it into my brain so that I never forget. And right there, she starts crying. And it's not because she's uncomfortable. I mean, that's her husband. She's fine doing that. I think it's the the moment is like oh, he doesn't actually believe what he's saying, that he's going to come back to me alive. And I think that's her kind of really realizing that in the moment. See, I, I read that, though, as him wanting to burn that image of, of Michiko in his mind so that he would remember what he was fighting for. He wasn't out there fighting to for for the emperor or for the expansion of Imperial Japan. He's out there fighting to get home to Michiko. Like, that's his plan. That's what he wants. And that is that what that image is for him. That was my view of it. No, I can see that, too. I do think there's part of him, though, that's like... Yeah. Because because I, I the, the reason I say that is because of her reaction of just, like, yeah. bursting yeah. into tears. Well, and he's not stupid. He knows the chances of him coming back are pretty pretty damn slim. Yeah. Jack and shit and, and slim and, you know what I'm saying, that catch that phrase. Especially as, you know, I, I think by this point, by, like, 1943, like the Japanese had a lot of success right out of the gate, but by 1943, I think Midway had already happened Mm. and the tide had turned for the Japanese army. And at this point, it was part of the island hopping campaign, that grinding warfare as the U.S. made its way to the home islands. Well, and you can kind of see in this movie how the morale is definitely lowering because I think the more, the further we get into the movie, the more desperate and the meaner they're getting. Yeah, um, I mean to the point where, at some point, the veterans who we'll talk about in a, in a in a minute here, but the veterans at some point later are even getting to the point where like this mission makes no sense. Why are we doing this? Like, why would yeah. we do this when we should be over here? Like, we're all going to get slaughtered. Like, even yeah. they're questioning it, and and for the most part, they were the guys that were just like, "No, oh, you have to fight for Japan." Blah blah blah. Shut up. Do your do your job. 
but suddenly they're, you know, concerned. Um, and then especially when they're fighting side by side, we kind of see some of their true colors too. Um, what is interesting too, because they are in Manchuria, right? So they are on the border with what would be Soviet forces, mm -hmm. uh, which up to this point, the Soviet hasn't, the whole Soviet Union hasn't been, well, in 1943, certainly, the Soviet Union wasn't actively fighting the uh, Japanese in that part of the world, as far as I know. I'd have to look that up to be sure, because I don't think it really started in kind until the war in Europe was finished. And that was the deal that um, I think was made at Yalta or one of those conferences of like, Europe first, we get Hitler, and then everybody joins in and we get Japan. Well, we do get the Soviet stuff towards the end of the movie. And I think yeah, that's, well, that's because... Yeah, in the second half when we're in 1945. By yeah, because that's, that's, that's when, when we start to hear about Germany surrendering. Yeah, this is when everything's starting to uh, come to a head. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, so the 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 veterans, Jason. How how would you describe these the these vets as they're called? Upperclassmen, fucking just guys that have been around for so long, and they've all had the shit beaten out of them over the years, and they've just become the bullies that their superiors used to be. So if you if they're this just was, part of the cycle of violence. If this was Revenge of the Nerds, they would be the jocks. Yes, 100%. And so which one would be that crazy one that's like, oh, well, I hate it nerds! Would be, it, actually, I don't know if, if jocks would be right, because it would be like if the jocks beat the fuck out of all the nerds, and then the nerds turned into jocks and beat the next generation of nerds. So it's, it's uh, imagine, well, hey, you know what? I don't know. Maybe that's the sequel. I've never seen Revenge of the Nerds 2. That's true. I haven't either. Electric. I saw. Nerdling. I think I saw Nerds in Paradise because that was rated PG thirteen, and I could rent it. Mm, I'm sure it's a classic film you remember all yeah, of. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, oh yeah. Every right. every minute. I mean, I'll I'll say this: it probably has a hundred percent less rape than the first one. I I yeah. I would say I would be willing to put money on it. <laughs> um, but yeah, these guys are these guys are real bad. I think almost like even worse than. Like the guards and stuff that we get in the first movie, because in in this one, the these these guys are there's no there's no there's no real rhyme or reason to this. They're just kind of awful to everyone, all the yeah. all the private all the privates anyway. Yeah, they just think because they're more superior, they can just like take advantage of them, and beat them up and shit. And they take their food. <laughs> yeah. Like they, yeah, they they take their food. They don't get any meat because the uh, the veterans decided they wanted another helping. So Kaji and Kaji's basically in that part of the movie where Kaji has come into this camp. He is training, or not training, but he's like basically commanding these new recruits, right? He's a PFC at that point. Yeah, exactly. And he's doing his best to kind of train them his way, but also protect them from the veterans. And he's trying to eat as much shit himself. So that his his guys don't have to, but that doesn't mean that they don't have to because they do. They they like one guy's button is loose, so he gets it torn off and get beaten up, and then gets another beating when he goes to get the fucking button back. Yeah, it's it's, it's messed up too that like not only are these are these veterans like abusing, you know, all the privates, they're essentially assaulting Kaji in front of his men. Yeah, in front of his his lowers, I guess. Yeah, and it makes him. I mean. Yeah, normally you wouldn't want that to happen because it makes you look weak. Yeah. But I think Kaji's men also kind of get what he's doing because he's probably very different than any other Japanese uh, 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 PFC that they'd encountered. Well, and we have all the, like, some of the, some of the very few kind of positive, upbeat moments is when you see him with his troops because he's very much, he's, he's very, like, he's, he's pretty casual at, to a point. I mean, he's still, he's still a leader and he's still telling them, you know, to salute and all that stuff. Yeah. But he does tell them, like, when they, when they use slang words around him, he kind of goes, well, you know, that's fine. But, like, just make sure you don't do that around certain people because they will yeah. just he's, ruth ruthlessly beat you. He's trying to explicitly explain to them the social code that most of them would normally discover just by getting the shit kicked out of them constantly. Yeah. And trying to give them a, you know, tr try to teach them how not to give the vets any excuse to beat them up. Although the vets, if they want to, they just will. Should be noted too, um, Kaji getting promoted is not any kind of nice complimentary thing that no. they do. The whole reasoning behind this, and we get a scene of this earlier, is that is one of the commanders. He says, you know, I think Kaji, Kaji's got balls, essentially. 
And yeah. because he comes up to them, uh, the, Obara, going back to Obara, when Obara kills himself, Kaji goes right up to the, to the command and says, Yoshida pushed him into this. He is responsible, and I'm just letting you know I'm going to fuck him up when I see him. Yeah. Or or if you don't do something, I'm going to do something, essentially. Well, and this this is a bit of a break, because isn't like this is the first time we really see Kaji mad? Like, even when he slapped yeah. Chen in the last movie, he wasn't super mad. He did it because he had to. Yeah. This time, he's fucking got murder in his eyes. He is going to kill Yoshida. Well, yeah, compared to the first one where he wa- he just wants that guy to get prosecuted. Yeah. In this one, he yeah. says, I'm going to kill. I'm going to kill him. And well, I think he's starting to learn that that things don't work the way you want them to in the Japanese military. If you want to get this done, you're going to have to do it yourself. And their response is very much like, um, oh, shit. He's got balls. I think he should. I think we should promote him because you know what? When we promote him, he's going to lose those leftist ideals very quickly. He's going to realize they don't work, and we're going to mold him into one of us. That's why he's plus, getting promoted. He's not getting plus, promoted. Yeah, goodness of and it heart. keeps him busy, Brendan. It keeps him occupied, so he's not out fostering red sentiment among the troops. He has to focus on training these guys. Yeah, yeah, and I think, and when when they said that too, I said, I wonder how this is going to how this is going to turn is this movie going to tell us that you know um that somebody like kaji can eventually be corrupted in some way or is there or is it going to tell us that you know there has to be a little bit of that in you to begin with even if you're not fully embracing that it's like when somebody it's like when when you hear these stories about like somebody say like you know I, I had a uh, somebody says i have a friend i've known for years and then suddenly i read that they assaulted someone and I was like, "What? Like I did? I never knew that was a part of your, of you at mm. all." And it's yeah. just like, "Was that always there? Did that just happen? You know what I mean? Like it, it, that's so. I think that's the question I have. Is I'm wondering if if they're going to address something like that. I know a magician who ran down a person in his car and then spent some time in prison. Uh, you you personally know a magician that did that? Yes. David Blaine. Mm, I'll tell you off air. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, wow, David Copperfield never knew. Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 just something I think I'm gonna keep an eye on in the next movie. Yeah. Um, uh, I was gonna say the the moment that really stands out to me in the course of both these movies, there is one moment of happiness, one moment of relief, one moment of of in the middle of all this, like some just joy. And that is when Kaji and a bunch of his troops get sent off on a work party yeah. to dig trenches and he, they, it's going to be gone for about a month. And now I did some math and I think this would mean that they were, this was through June of 45. So they're getting real close to the end of the war. Um, but when we cut to them, they've been there, they're all shirtless. They're fucking digging trenches. They've all got smiles on their faces. They're enjoying themselves. They're getting fresh air. They're tan. It's like the happiest that any of them have been in a long time. Cause they're away from the vets. They're away from the bullshit of the camp. They're just out working. But you know what? That whole time, they don't really address it that much, but that whole time I'm also like, they only took it, told him to take 28 of his men. Yeah. So there's other yeah. 22, whatever are back there who knows what the fuck they're dealing with yeah and and when the i i think they all end up in like the they die in the attack yeah. on the fort most, when the soviets most first of them come die. yeah yeah Almost well no the, most of them all do but like those those ones that were left back there died during the initial attack that they're not there for well we even have a guy coming back from the first movie kagayama um who was in the the first one and and he he's like the new um He's like the commander of he's like Kaji's boss where yeah. he's somewhat sympathetic to him. Like he's not yeah. a monster, but I mean, he comes back, but then we find out off off screen that he was killed as well. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, that is a nice moment. And like I said, though, it's like this movie, it's like it gives you that nice moment. But at the same time, in the back of your head, you're like, don't forget about this. It's like the first one. We had a brief nice moment where him and uh, Michiko got to leave. And they were yeah. kind of enjoying their day for a while until it obviously got cut off. But even before it got cut off, you're still thinking like, oh, what's happening at the camp now that he's not there yeah. to, to to mediate, you know? What shit, what shit is going to go bad, you know? Yeah. 
Uh, and, also- and again, knowing that knowing that their this time was in the summer of forty five, it's like, well, the war's coming to an end soon. The Soviets are going to invade. When when is that going to happen? And that's what we're waiting for. So yeah, uh, we also I mentioned uh, we didn't talk about Shinjo. Yes, character Shinjo who makes it. He escapes. He runs right across the border. Yeah, he defects to the Soviets. He was thinking that there were, there were rumors that there was like utopia over there or that it was a, like a great existence. And uh, it probably wasn't great, but it's probably still better than being in a Japanese army camp. Will he be welcome as a Japanese soldier, though? <sighs> That's a good question. I guess maybe I mean, we'll he'd find probably out be in. He'd, he'd definitely be interrogated. and But... I mean, I don't know. I don't know how the Soviets treat because the Soviets, it was like anything. Like in warfare, they would always encourage their enemy to to come over mm-hmm. and use lure, like like maybe rumors, but also like talk of food and shelter and things like that. Because he seems Women. like a, he <laughs> seems like a counterpoint to um, Obara in a way. Like he's also dealing with some shit. He gets relentlessly insulted, but he kind of knows how to take it in and respond to it. He's doing the same thing as 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 Kaji is. He's able. He has the physical ability to be a good soldier and thus help avoid. Because he obviously he clearly has questions about his loyalties and about his ideology and whether he's a red as well. So, mm-hmm. and clearly uh, he's willing to defect to the Soviets. So, well, is he must not, have a little bit of red in him? Is is he not? And maybe this maybe this wasn't him in this scene, but is he not in that scene where they go to that village? Um, where they they they're walking. It's him and another guy, and they're walking along, and they hear a gunshot, and the mm. other guy, not Shinjo, thinks that the fi- this fisherman guy was shooting at them. Yes. And so when they're in this house, I mean, he he. First of all, the other guy tries to rape the woman there. I mean, yeah. he gets pretty close to doing it before Shinjo steps in and is like, "What the hell what? are you doing?" Was that was that a different guy? Todd Todd begins with a T. He was, um, yeah, perhaps this is, this might be, this might be a different set of characters, but we should mention it anyway. (laughs) But, but yeah, he, he essentially almost rapes this woman and then, and then kills and kills her husband. Like he shoots and kills him to the point later where they say like, well, we would have the guy who didn't help him do this. We would have uh, thrown you in jail or had you executed, but you know, the guy got killed. So it's fine. Mm-hmm. No evidence that this guy was shooting at them to begin with. He's a fisherman. It's like this is like um this this is like reminds me of like when you uh a lot like Vietnam War movies. I mean this is nineteen fifty nine version, so you can't go that far. But it reminds me of Vietnam War movies where they come into a village and just essentially take over and it's like, you know what? No, this person's gotta die. They're evil. They're on the they're on the Viet Cong side. Don't 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 waste time, just shoot them. Was it Tarada or or there there was uh, maybe it was Naruto? Maybe it was Naruto, yeah. But it, yeah. but isn't but doesn't that remind you of that a little bit though? Like the Vietnam War movie, like when they when they show like those kinds of war crimes. Yeah. Like yeah. I said, obviously you, it's not as explicit as a lot of those movies because those were made after the the moral code was dropped, and you could show more in in films. But mm-hmm. there was definitely the implication that he was not planning on doing anything nice to uh, that guy's wife. No, and the Japanese were. Uh, I may have mentioned it before, but as I understand, one of the one of the things the Japanese command do did specifically was encourage their troops, when especially when they were fighting like Americans, to do terrible war crime things, so that the Americans would then be doing it back to the Japanese, and thus the Japanese would be less likely to surrender to the Americans because they didn't want surrender at all. Right. It was it was dire dire. Well, that was it. Win or die. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and the, the, so the whole thing with Shinjo and how it tie, it ties into something else too, is because it's Kaji and Yoshida. And you'll remember Yoshida is the one that uh, bullied Obara into suicide earlier. Hmm. Uh, uh, Kaji and Yoshida that are, that are chasing after him, but obviously Kaji shoves Yoshida into the essentially what I think is quicksand or some, some version of that. Yeah, I, I think that's the implication. It, it looks like muddy water, but I think the implication is it's some sort of thick mud. Yeah, so he, he shoves him in there, and, uh, and, and you know, Kaji nearly dies. But in that moment, Jason, he still can't kill Yoshida. He, he could have killed him very cleanly and probably without getting caught. 
Mm. And in the, even in that moment, he's like, I'm not going to kill him. But he does make him promise to uh, uh, to admit that he pushed Obara into suicide. And will he do it? We'll never know because Yoshida fucking dies. Yeah. It's a shame. Don't really. have to answer that question. It's a shame. Yoshida, yeah. one of our best. <laughs> Private Yoshida, folks. PFC. We love him, don't we, folks? Strong military man. Strong man. Good ideas. He loved rooftops. Only loved his troops, folks. Only loved his troops. Did the best for them. If he committed one crime, it was loving too much. And maybe, as well as the many war crimes. And maybe coercing someone into suicide, but mostly loving too much. <laughs> loved his country. Big circle. Big circle with a white background. We love the Japanese flag, don't we, folks? <laughs> um... But yeah, so and that I mean we mentioned a little bit of the second half, but that's essentially the first hundred minutes of the movie is the basic training stuff. And then when in the second, like the seventy nine minute portion or whatever, that's when we really start to see the vets really kind of give them the business. Yeah, and and we finally do culminate in a battle scene at the end of part two. Yeah. Which involves now I don't know if there were some special effects used here or or something, but there might be the most tanks on screen, like real tanks on screen that I've ever seen in a movie. There's at least twelve of them, I think. Jason, this whole last scene, I'm like, it, this movie, these movies are already so far incredible, but like, and they look amazing. But for this, for the battle scene to even be at this level was mm. was shocking to me like i thought like okay we're gonna have like a kind of a quick thing here like i can't i because I, th I think this movie focuses a lot more on the human drama right yeah yeah but in that shot where you see the horizon and those tanks just slowly come up over the horizon it's it's a cool moment because number one like you said they they have all these tanks or maybe they're miniatures or whatever but still it still looks great at the same and at the same time it's a real like holy fuck kind of yeah. moment like they're they're fucked there's just yeah. there's no other way to say it well and and earlier in the movie kaji gets sent out on a on a um a recon mission and he sees the tanks and he reports back he's like there's 14 tanks out there and they're like really did your did your guys see it he's like no i left them behind a rock why did you leave them behind a rock because they're not trained to be scouts anyways there's 14 tanks it's like yeah sure there is buddy fuck off yeah why send him out yeah, if you're not going to believe, believe them. them, but that's not me saying the realism of the movie. That's me saying I believe that that they would do this. But I'm just saying, as as <laughs> real history thing, why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's a brutal, it's a brutal, brutal battle to the point where when they're called away, by the way, to go to fight, there's a bunch of them that don't even have fucking rifles. Yeah, because they're saying, they just do. Just what? tell them lash a bayonet to a branch. Yeah. And it's like, wait, so you're not going to give us guns? It's like, listen, I don't choose when we go to war. Let's go. <laughs> like, no contingency plan whatsoever for if we suddenly go to war. There's no, there's, you know, there's no uh, weapon supply or anything like that. Um, yeah. And th there's even a moment, uh, there's a moment in this movie, too. I know we talked about Kubrick watching this, but I feel like. Uh, Masaki Kobayashi might have watched All Quiet on the Western Front because mm. there's a moment where the, uh, somebody gets their arm taken off. And yeah. it's a quick shot, and it reminded me so much of that shot in All Quiet when it's on the fence. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was just, reminded of Star Wars. You got reminded of Star Wars. Yeah, because remember when, when Ben cuts off that uh, uh, walrus man's arm in the beginning of uh, New Hope? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the one thing George Lucas watched all nine hours of this movie and was like, that's the thing I'm going to take from it. You know what? I wouldn't be surprised if George Lucas had also seen this movie. Hey, he's watched a lot of Japanese movies. I mean, come on. He's watched a lot of Kurosawa. It wouldn't be surprising if he watched uh, this movie. He's watched a lot of dog movies like the Dan Busters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. His favorite dog character. He, that was what, uh, he, had that, he had that dog in mind when he uh, uh, created Jar Jar Binks. Yeah, he's like, can I... Uh... Can I can I can I use the same name for this alien, uh, George? I don't think that's a great idea. Uh, okay, well I'll just I'll just get uh, Ahmed Best to be really stereotypical, and I'll just give him the same name as the dog in the Dam Busters. No, George, I think that's a real bad idea. Uh, Coke Zero, 
two sugars. I, I like that Ahmed Best has uh, uh, been, as a an actor, been rehabilitated. As Jar Jar was not his fault. It was not and his he's, fault. Uh, and he's uh, also he was uh, he did what he was told, and he also now shows up as a couple other roles in and, Star Wars. And let's just let's just put the brakes on for a second too. Jar Jar Binks is not even close to the worst thing that's come out of Star Wars. Come on. I mean, he's up there. He's annoying, but like we've had plenty of dumb shit from that from those movies. I mean, they are movies for children. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, is it really ruining our lives? Like so many people claim that Jar Jar Binks is like the epitome of evil <laughs> brendan it's the entire reason i didn't get laid in my uh, uh teens oh yeah that's it that's the whole reason yep yeah. well you were you were running... i was always going on about jar jar binks yeah you were running around with your underwear on your head but it all had to do with jar jar binks <laughs> i was trying to get section eight from school but it turned out section eight wasn't a thing uh in the school system so <laughs> um but yeah so this this whole battle scene i mean his his buddies, his comrades, they're getting killed left and right. People are losing their minds and jumping out of the trench and running. People are uh, trying to give other people bullets and getting shot and killed immediately. Things are blowing up. Tanks are firing. And then this is the moment, Jason. This is a real big moment in Kaji's, I think, humanity. Or maybe, you know, a, in the detriment to his humanity. Is that he has to kill a Japanese soldier to save himself and another Japanese soldier. Yeah. Because he literally has to choke one of them to death. Yeah. Um, because well, he's this, trying to stop him. Yeah. This firing. guy's going crazy. This guy's trying to attack yeah. them and yell. Yeah. And the, the, the three, three dudes in a, in a foxhole, they're not really going to be able to take out one tank, let alone the many tanks that are out there. Yeah, so it's like a moment he's stopping him. Is you don't even realize it as it's happening, but then he starts like foaming at the mouth, and Kaji realizes obviously what he's done, and then he almost kills the other guy who gets mad at him. Like he starts choking him out a little bit, um, and then as you as you kind of the scene kind of goes where Kaji is getting up after everyone's passed, and he's yelling to see if anyone's still alive out there, and it doesn't look like they are. It looks like he's all alone, a prisoner mm -hmm. of his own mind. Ooh, you look just like Buddy Holly. Oh, Mary Tyler Moore. Is that what you were saying? Is, no, Brendan. What I'm saying is that at this point, Kaji was a hitchhiker on the road to eternity. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah, I mean... Damn. <laughs> uh, do you have any other big things you want to discuss, Jason, before we move on to our bits and our bombs? I am ready to move forward, Brendan. All right. We'll move forward. We shall because we are going to take a brief break and we will be right back on one human condition that you stick around. Thanks. Hello, friends. This is the ghost of Peter Lorre. You know, when I'm bored up in uh, movie star heaven, it's very different than Republican heaven. We don't tell anybody about it, and it's, we can get a good drink there. I like to listen to podcasts because there's nothing else to do. And when I listen to a podcast, I listen to For Screen and Country because it talks about movies that I might like. A lot of them are very old. This is Peter Lorre saying, Age of Radio is a thing you should look for. The last thing you want to hear when you need your auto insurance most is... Thank you for calling. Please listen to your list of 46 possible service options. Which is why when you choose USAA Auto Insurance, you'll get great service that is easy and reliable. 24-7 online service for claims, access to roadside assistance, and more. All at the touch of a button. Start getting the service you deserve. Get a quote today. USAA. Ability to receive a quote depends on membership eligibility. Membership eligibility and product restrictions apply and are subject to change. USAA means United Services Automobile Association and its affiliates, San Antonio, Texas. The family that vacations together stays together. At least that was the plan. Except now the dastardly desk clerk is saying he can't confirm your connecting rooms. Uh, wait, what? That's right, ma'am. You have rooms 201 and 709. No, we cannot be five floors away from our kids. Eh, the doors have double locks. They'll be fine. When you want your connecting rooms confirmed before you arrive, it matters where you stay. Welcome to Hilton. I see your connecting rooms are already confirmed. Hilton, for the stay. 
This episode is brought to you by Indeed. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash MBO. Terms and conditions apply. Human condition or human dancers? My sign is vital. My hands are cold, and I'm on my knees looking for the answer. Human condition or human dancers. Bits and bombs. Got some lovely snow right out of the gate. Beautiful, Beautiful shot snow. to open the movie. And lots of, and it's good looking snow. I mean, it's mm. movie snow, but it's pretty good. I, I hope nobody suffered any like arsenic poisoning or anything from the, mm. from the terrible snow. But, but as we, as we noted, the, uh, uh the, Mr. Nakata is still alive. So he is, he's like, he's like 92, I think. Still kicking. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a thesis statement, really, for the, the this movie, and I'm sure the next one. Kaji's desire for justice continues to get him hurt. Mm-hmm. <sighs> if they straighten up, they could be our best soldiers. Again, trying to avoid some suspicion by just being good soldiers, so that they can't complain about that. I, I noted um, they're still... They're utilizing again those big like wide open vistas for their outdoor for the exterior shots like when they're out on the field or they're marching or whatever you can tell like you can you can absolutely tell this is shot on location um it's beautiful uh real backgrounds you know beautiful black and white cinematography it just it really stands out it it looks like an epic the whole time yeah it does, it does. Beautiful long shots, like where you see like the silhouettes of the soldiers in the distance. Mm. You know, with some of that in the first movie, but also uh, with the workers, but also with the soldiers in this movie. Yeah. Um, the beatings are bad enough in this army. That would be enough to fuck up a person. But the but the humiliation that comes along with it, the, the the as we pointed out, the whole scene of forcing Obara to act like a prostitute and and beckon to people, just fucking sick. Yeah, the mental and abuse is worse than the physical abuse. I how think. does that make a better soldier in any way? It doesn't. It's All just... that does is get you fucking private piled, which, the, the you know, Yoshida was lucky that, that Obara didn't fucking do that to him. Um, I noticed in one scene, uh, in the scene where Michiko and um, uh, Kaji are about to have their night together, uh, one of the guy, one of the privates, who's friend, who obviously seems to be on friendly terms with Kaji, drops off some food, and then the subtitle reads, "Rider good." Yeah, <laughs> rider good, baby. <laughs> yeah, everybody was jealous. That's it. They just wanted to to show their support. Doesn't that guy like tell Kaji that he should be allowed to have his wife come in too, and that he should talk to the uh, talk to the base commander or, or Ka- Kageyama because he knew him? Well, he asks Michiko to to write to his wife to get her oh, to write right, a yes. letter so that she can come in. And there's it's kind of an awkward moment. I think Kaji in, in his head is like, they're probably not going to let this happen twice. <laughs> mm. <laughs> also, I got to say, um, Michiko, like the actress who plays Michiko, uh, I mean, I realized it in the first one, but in this one, it just even more, not to sound like a typical guy, but she is a gorgeous woman. Yes, very much so. Very much so. She was a, a smoking lady in her day. And terrific. Terrific actor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so Yoshida, I thought it was that Yoshida died, not that he died, like, in the battle, that he died of a, a fever off screen. No, that's he? what I said. Yeah, Yoshida okay, died yeah. in the, well, no, but Kaji, what I'm saying is Kaji saved him when they were both in that mud. Yeah. Like, he couldn't even kill him in that moment. Like he had every opportunity to just he could have just let him drown, you know. Yeah. Um. But then again, he but he tells him like you know make sure you tell them that you're responsible for Obara if I save you. But then he dies off screen anyway, so we never actually know if he was gonna yeah. do that at all. Uh, at one point, Kaje briefly meets a private Tanga, 
who he finds to be a kindred spirit and literally tells him the line about how kindred spirits find each other. Yeah. That was uh, from the first one, I think, was it not? Yeah, because Tonga like, stands up and defends somebody Yeah, uh, uh, in the same way that Kaji might. Mm-hmm. So it was rare to see that in, in this army. Yeah. Um, I wrote, it's almost a Stooges movie with all the slapping. It's get it like at certain points, like it's almost comical. There's just, they just keep fucking hitting people. It's just big old swinging slaps. Like, but it is, but God it's damn. accompanied by this, this brutality that, you know, permeates this whole movie. And it just, it's, it's hard to watch at times. Hmm. And then in the second part, you know, the, the bit about hierarchy being so in, uh, important. It's, it's June of 45 because they talk about Okinawa being occupied. And Okinawa was one of the most brutal battles of the war and was the, the preview of how uh, Operation Downfall might have gone if Japan had have been uh, fully invaded by the United States mm-hmm. and us and the British and the Soviets. Yeah, us. You said it. The United States. Yeah. <laughs> Us, the Canadians, and the U.S. and the Soviets. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote <laughs> uh, uh, just constant abuse, but Kaji still remains Kaji. And as soon as I wrote that down, then Kaji pulled out a knife. <laughs> no, he's hit a breaking point. Yeah. <laughs> At that point, that finally he's like he's ready to fucking just cut Yoshida open right then and there. Well, that's but, and that's after the point that he's already told them that he's going to murder Yoshida. Yeah. And that's the that's the situation where Naruto pulls him off and is returning the favor because Naruto had almost gotten himself into some shit earlier and gotten into a fight and Kaji had pulled him away. So Naruto did the same for Kaji. Every time I heard Naruto's name, by the way, I know you probably thought it too. I could only think of yeah. one thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, how many Naruto's do you know besides the uh, the Naruto run guy? Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I don't even know really the Naruto run guy. The real uh, the real reason I know it is because that guy did it at Area 51. Oh yeah, well yes, the, the Naruto run. Of course, <laughs> they said a, they were going to memorific dance. They said they were going to Naruto run. run their way through the gate, to yep. which I reply, to which I remember saying, "Oh, we're going to see a lot of Naruto's die that day." I was all for it. Uh, I wasn't going to go, but I was all for it. Um, <laughs> you, so you were you were the guy behind the scenes, kind of being like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah." Please, please. We, well, we need to know what's in there, and I'm not risking my life. No. Um, our real enemy, someone says, is the army. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. He said, "It's not necessarily the the veterans, the the individual people that are that are being like this. It's the whole, it's the power structure. Hmm. It's like it's like yeah. when someone says, like, well, you know, there are people, there are police officers that are trying to make, trying to make it better from within, or you know, they're they're genuinely good people and they treat people with respect. Yes." But it's the system that's broken. It's not just necessarily yeah. because every single police officer is a monster. Yeah. Uh, we have a moment where Kageyama tells uh, Kaji that picking the army as the stage for your battles was a fool's errand. Mm-hmm. It's true, I suppose. If, if, of all the places to make a stand, the army seems like a bad place to do it. But uh, but you know what? Kageyama's a good guy. One of the last things he does uh, the last time he sees uh, Kaji is give him about four or five packs of cigarettes. So, yeah. Good man. Um, they got a plane for this movie. It was only a small plane, but they had a plane flyover, so that was cool. I mean, this, these movies have a budget. It's clear yeah. they have a budget. Yeah, the amount of tanks they had, I swear, un, I they either had that many tanks or they had, like, a few tanks and they had, like, trucks dressed up as tanks or something. But it looked like a real shot of, like, 15 tanks. And these movies were only in production, like, probably, like, 13 years after the war ended. Like, yeah, yeah. So there, I mean, there was probably still surplus available. Yeah. Uh, it's funny at the end of the. It's funny when the movie after he kills that guy that he's like, "I'm a monster. I'm a monster." It's like, oh, now you're realizing this, Kaji. I mean, you've been part of this whole system the whole time. You're kind of a, kind of a monster, anyways, just for participating in it. But I don't think he's a monster. We well, I mean, he's he's uh, he's aiding and abetting a terrible system. I know he's trying to do his best and trying to to uh, mitigate some of the harm. But at the end of the day, he's still working in favor of of what we would have considered the enemy. Well, I mean, if you remember the fascist first, system, if you remember in the first film, he he did what he did because he didn't want to serve with the Japanese Imperial Army because he didn't believe yeah. in it. And in the second yeah. film, he's pretty much he's forced to do that. Like, there's no, oh, I know. 
There's nothing of him being like, I want to help the Japanese. Well, no. I mean, but again, it's like it's like in the last movie where we were talking about like how he kept trying to do all this stuff within the realm of the system and he could never get anything done. And the one thing he did that made a difference was going outside the system, right? And it got him fucked over. Maybe he didn't want to make that mistake in this one, but the fact is he could have deserted. He could have defected. I mean, it would have meant leaving Michigo behind, and that's pretty fucked up, and I know he didn't want to do that, but he did have options, as terrible as they might have been. Well, that, and if he's, tr- if he, I mean, in the first movie, he is trying to fix the system, and if he just has stopped doing what he was doing, and he was also living under the fear that as soon as he gave up or left, everything would go back to the way it was, and that's what ended up happening. Hmm. I mean, I don't I mean, think he, I, I think by the second movie, his 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 desire is less for justice and more to get back to Michiko. I think that ultimately is what his his desire becomes. And if serving in, in the army and getting out of it, that's what he's going to do. It is about survival, but I think he's also still sticking up for people. Like I said, he does try he to save Obara. He does try to help Shinjo. Yeah, he, he can't stop himself along the way. He but can't what I'm stop saying is, is that his being, his angle has changed slightly. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe first and foremost now he's trying to save his own skin. Uh, I mean, not going to blame him for that after what he's gone no. through in these movies so far. And for the good of his wife, because he knows his wife wants him to come home. Right. He wants to come home. Right. Yeah, so that's pretty much all I got there, Brennan. Okay. Well, like I said, like I said last week, uh, I think we're gonna save the, uh, you know, if we have, if there's any like trivia stuff behind the scenes to, about the making of the movie, I think we're gonna save it when we to when we get to the end of this whole thing, and get to the end we shall, Jason, because next week we are going to tackle the final chapter of the human condition, the third one. It's that's what it's called, the human condition, the third one. Yep. It's a great um, subtitle. It's perfect. Yep. There actually is a movie. Um, I think it's called, I think it, literally there's a movie called The Witch, the second one. And it's not a <laughs> comedy. <laughs> so. Is it? Is it a sequel to The Vavitch? No, it is not. Oh, it's okay. completely separate from that. I mean, I'm sure there's been a million movies named The Witch uh, over the last century. Mm. Mm-hmm. Witches of Eastwick. Uh, Which Way to Honolulu. Uh, which uh, war? And that's a that's a Monty Python esque play on words. Which war? which country should we invade next? Which country? Yeah. Well, Jason, next week we are going to take. I said, like I said, we're going to take on the final chapter of this triptych. We are going to talk about the human condition. The third one. It's actually called a soldier's prayer. After the Japanese defeat to the Russians, Kaji leads the last remaining men through Manchuria, intent on returning to his dear wife and his old life. Kaji faces great odds in a variety of different harrowing circumstances as he and his fellow men sneak behind enemy lines. So we are going to get, yeah, this is it. This is we're going to find out if he's going to make it, if it's if it's going to end well for him or if it's going to end in tragedy. We'll find out. Well, there's still there's only like a month left before the atoms bomb. Adams, Adam's bomb. bomb. The Adams bomb. As the like, governor's general, the Adams bomb. Was that what uh, no. the Blink One Eighty Two song "Adams Song" is about? Yeah, no, it was about it was about uh, Nagasaki specifically. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I throw a bomb at Japan. No, that's terrible. Just... Fun fact that I learned. Did you know? So you know how in uh, Oppenheimer they test a nuke, right? Yeah, the Trinity device. So that that was the basis for the uh, uh, is it F- Fat Man the Fat Man nuke, which was the nuke they dropped on Nagasaki, right? The first nuke, the one they dropped, the little boy that they dropped on uh, Nagas or on Hiroshima, they didn't even test that hmm. because the design was such the design was so simple that they believed we don't even need to bother testing this. This is just going to fucking work. Wow, and it did. Whereas whereas the Trinity device needed to be tested because it was such a precision assembled thing. You remember in the movie, they assembled like that sphere, right? Like it was a very specific way they were doing it to do it that way. Yeah, the scene of them testing it, the testing scene in Oppenheimer is a little bit memorable, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a good spot. It's a good scene. <laughs> it's, one that, it's one that sticks out still for me. Um, but yeah, so Jason, we're going to talk about the human condition. The third one, um, I keep saying that. <laughs> Yeah, because it, it feels weird to me to say the human condition three, but I guess that's what it is. But before we move on to that next week, Jason, tell me 
uh, final thoughts on this second installment. I mean, the, the hit continues. The hits continue, ladies and gentlemen. This was very good. I really appreciate diving more into the military side of things and seeing how Kaji's dealing with it. Uh, it reinforces how terrible the place the Japanese army was in the 40s. And uh, I really want to see what happens to our pal. I want to see if he gets out of this. Yeah, I don't have high hopes for that. Yeah. For him escaping But, you know, this. hey, it could be happy. There could, the human condition could be happiness, Brendan. Feel like that hasn't been the the the, the case so far. <laughs> no, but the nukes are coming, and once the nukes happen, the nukes bring happiness. Um, Jason, you're watching too many, I think, American propaganda films. <laughs> Nuclear power will save us all. <laughs> um, wow. So anyway, yeah, no, this is it is it is terrific. It's it's obviously again, like I said last week, this is it's very clear why this is a kind of beloved uh masterpiece of japanese film i mean it is it is epic it is uh and again it's another movie that is uh just a hair under three hours and paced great pacing is great it doesn't feel yeah. it doesn't feel like it's too long it doesn't feel like it's just it's right um, it's and, your Empire. It's your Two Towers. Yeah. It's your Star Trek Three because that was the middle of the trilogy. Okay. It's your. It's your. What other middle trilogy films are there? It's your Terminator uh, Two. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, technically. You know what? I only consider those two movies and forget about the rest of them. I liked the last one they did. That was good. It was nice that they made an attempt. Did you see Dark Fate? No, I did not. Oh, it's. It, I think you'd like it. It's quite good. Possibly. More akin to the James Cameron Terminator movies than anything else I've seen, other than James Cameron's movies. I just wish James Cameron would have directed it instead of fucking around with Avatar all the time. Avatar 2 was really good, though. I mean, yes, it was enjoyable. Okay, anyway, we're going to talk about Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> Human Condition. We'll, fi we'll I mean, finish. Aren't, aren't the Avatar movies technically war movies, Brendan? Yeah, but you know what? Everyone knows about that. Those movies, we don't need to discuss them. <laughs> not they, not they one do. of them. If one of them was on this list, Jason, I would make a point of doing both of them, but neither of them are, so okay. we're just going to forget about it. All right. They're great movies. Watch them. They're they're good. Um, but yeah, next week we're going to finish off this trilogy, The Human Condition. Um, but until then, uh, we are going to say goodbye. And before that, I'm going to say, hey, you could check us out on social media. We are on Facebook. Just search for us. We are on Twitter and Blue Sky at FSAC Pod. That stands for For Screen and Podcast. You can also find us at our home base at Age of Radio. You can go to ageofradio.org slash For Screen and Gunda. Or just find us on any podcast app by searching for our name, which is again For Screen and Country. Right. Jason, you. What about you? Where are you? How can I find you? Uh, where can I meet you? Uh, where is you? What are you? How are you? Uh, at Jason D. McLeod on uh, Twitter, on Blue Sky, and on Instagram. I, I, I reactivated my Instagram. You're so. on Instagram now? Yeah. Wow. It's getting real, folks. Yeah. It's getting real. I, just, I, I literally reactivated it just so I could follow... Paul F. Tompkins and Scott Ackerman and Lauren Lapkus and Wow, you really know how to freedom. sell the hell of an Instagram out of an Instagram yeah. account. I'm on there to follow people, so follow me yeah, because I'm to not to follow doing anything. comedians I like. So follow me and maybe I'll reinsta or whatever the fuck. Reinsta. Oh boy, we're gonna get you those uh, learning annex social media classes. Yay. Um yeah, so that's it. So I can just put I can just put like whatever age in there, like like fourteen. Okay, is fine. Mister referencing SNL sketches we watched earlier tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna let you get that one by on the people. Damn. <laughs> so we'll see you next week for that. Um, but until then, Jason, I'm just going to just gonna say to you, whisper to you, like Dune, maybe. Maybe I won't whisper. Maybe I'll talk louder so you can hear me. I make eye contact with you, stare into your soul, and I will say to you, sir, God save the king. And can a fella get some chicken wing? Mm -mm. Sounds good. Mm. For Screening Country, I'm Brendan. And I'm Jason. Let's go eat chicken wings. Yeah, that'd be really... I really could eat a whole pound of friggin' chicken wings, Brendan. 
Uh, I don't know what to do with that. Bye. Bye. The Screen and Country was created by and stars Brendan Wall and Jason McLeod. The Human Condition, Road to Eternity from 1959 was directed by Masaki Kobayashi. I Goku Koshin Kyoku and A Cruel Ages Thesis, the theme from Neon Genesis Evangelion, served as this week's music. This has been an Age of Radio production, copyright 2024. <laughs>